Hi, uh, this video is about the lumbar interbody fusion operation, or in our case, the minimally invasive lumbar interbody fusion surgery. Uh, perhaps you've been offered this operation, you're about to undergo it. So this is just general information about how the procedure is carried out. Very briefly over the indications, we'll talk about some of the risks and benefits, uh, recovery as well. I've recently written a blog article for as a patient information sheet on the procedure itself. Uh, please feel free to read this. Uh, the link is in the description below on the procedure, how it's carried out um, and the different risks uh, of the procedure. In terms of the indications, I've done a separate YouTube video on um, spondylosis and spondylolisthesis. Uh, specifically spondylolisthesis is where is probably the commonest reason I do the procedure but there are some other indications as well. So you can click the link uh, to view this video and also visit the YouTube channel. So as mentioned the commonest reason I do the procedure for is called a spondylolisthesis which is a form of instability or forward slippage of one bone over the other. So we have an x-ray of someone before the procedure where one of the bones had slipped forward over time over the other due to a defect in the bone at the back. Um, if you can demonstrate instability at this level, then this is, uh, the operation is a good way of, of resolving this if conservative measures fail. Um, there are other reasons as well. If you can prove a certain level is a pain generator, this is rare, but if you can pr prove that a certain disc is causing the pain and is a pain generator and there's no compression, uh, that's another reason to do the procedure as well. So the procedure is carried out under a general anaesthetic. You're fully put to sleep, you're unaware of what's happening to you. You get a dose of intravenous antibiotics to help prevent uh, infection. And then you're laid on your front. And then we make two very small incisions in the lower back, either side of the midline. So through those two very small incisions, uh, using x-ray guidance or navigation, we pass four screws into the spine, so two in each bone that needs the screws in them in order to secure the two bones together. So if we look at a spine here, this is the front, this is the back. With x-ray guidance, a screw is put through the pedicle uh, of this bone, and another one is put into the pedicle of that bone, and the same is done on the other side. So this view here is a cross section looking from underneath. Uh, this is the pedicle here and here, and this is the spinal canal where all your nerves run through. So we very accurately place these screws just through that pedicle bone, avoiding all of the nerves. And then you can see on this image here, the heads of those screws are then connected with rods. That way, this bone here and that bone here, or in this case there and there, are joined, joined together so they can't move in relation to each other and that stabilizes them. Thereafter, under the microscope, um, we gain access to the back of this bone here uh, with very special retractors that prevent or reduce tissue damage to the soft tissues. And what we do is we create a little a window in the bone, removing some of the bone that we use for the graft. And the disc itself, this whole disc, is, is completely cleared out. And in its place, a cage is put in. The one I use is normally made of titanium but it depends on the case and the patient. And then within that cage, it's a, it's a breeze block essentially that contains some of the bone graft that we use um, from the bone that we've removed here. And it's placed in, in there and then everything's locked together so that you end up with four screws here and then this disc space is the cage. And what the screws do, they just hold everything together until over time, these two bones join up and form one bone. That way they cannot become unstable, they cannot move relative to each other. If one of the reasons we're doing the procedure is to decompress a nerve, uh, then during the procedure as well, we're ensuring that we can see that the nerve is completely free and decompressed by the end of the procedure. If we're doing it for a spondylolisthesis where one bone has slipped forward, as you can see in this case, um, we can also reduce this bone, pull it back in the process of putting the screws and the cage in. So this is before and this is after, and you can see now the spine's perfectly aligned. And this is the cage I was talking about. Within this, there is bone graft. And over time, this bone and this bone join up and form as one, 
whilst that's happening, these screws connected together by these rods are kind of holding everything in place until that takes effect. So once it's done, I usually close the wounds with uh, absorbable sutures that don't need to come out. And then we try and mobilize patients straight away. Um, the pain is usually around the wounds in the back that patients feel post-operatively, but they often notice a difference in the pre-existing type of back pain they had. Um, so you can expect one night stay in hospital, sometimes two at the most, but the physiotherapists get you up straight away. And my rule is if you can do a lap of the ward and a flight of stairs, that's usually, that usually means you're safe to go home at that stage. Um, I usually advise at least a six week period of recovery at home and not returning to work in that time frame. Now that doesn't mean you will be out of action for six weeks or, or needing to lie down or, or anything like that. I'd expect you to be mobilizing, going out for walks and doing the exercises that the physiotherapists give you. But what I really don't want is patients sat at a desk for another for eight hours a day um, trying to recover from this because that, that will be sore, that, that will be painful. So I usually advise a six week period of recovery, but during those weeks you'll find actually the pain uh, alleviates fairly quickly. Now, for the risks of the procedure uh, in my blog, I've taken a lot of this from the British Association of Spine Surgeons uh, information page, because uh, that's generally the advised booklet we give out to patients that advises on the procedure uh, and covers the risks and things like that purely for the process of uh, informed consent. A lot of this information is for, probably includes the risks for the open, more traditional way of doing the procedure and I suspect the risks are slightly less when doing it minimally invasively just because we're using a, a narrower approach, um, smaller wounds and also the help of navigation uh, but nonetheless these are the risks we quote which are taken from sort of generic uh, national data sets a lot of the data sets are relatively old so every operation under the sun carries some risk and if you go online you often read about paralysis and incontinence and um all that kind of stuff yes it's yes it is a potential risk because we're operating near nerves but every effort is made in the procedure to visualize the nerves especially with the use of microscopes uh, which is how I do the procedure, where you get a good view of all of the nerves and ensure you're protecting them. We quote that risk as between 1 in 300 to 1 in 1,000. I suspect it's less than that today. A lot of this data comes from old, um, very old research. Um, other risks that are a little bit more common, but less serious or easier to treat are infection. It's around 2% or so. Most of the time that can be that's superficial, i.e. near the wound and can be treated with antibiotics, but very rarely do we have to go in, wash the wound out, or in extreme situations, remove uh, the metal work. Um, another risk is fluid leak of the spine, the, the spinal canal, um, which I'll show you up, up here, um, where, where the nerves are. It's, con it's basically lined by a a thin walled sack that contains the nerves which are bathed in the fluid. Sometimes during the procedure um, you can cause a small tear in that lining and that can lead to a fluid leak. It's around 2% of the time, sometimes or, or some literature quotes 4 or 5%. Um, most of the time that can be repaired during the operation and that's, and that's the end of it. Um, sometimes it may persist and we lie patients flat uh, for a short period of time, very rarely again you have to go in and repair the defect. But it's very rare that that leads to any permanent um, problem. And then other things that are reported occasionally are in damage to major blood vessels. That's because just in front of the spine you have some of the major blood vessels and if the instruments slip, yes, there's a potential risk of causing damage to the vessels. I think the data quotes it as one in 10,000 cases or so, uh, but that's extremely rare. And then there's the risk of the metalwork failing or the fusion not taking effect. Now there are some risks of that, uh, sometimes diabetic patients or smoke, people who smoke, uh, sometimes the bones just don't fuse as well. So there are measures you can take to help improve that. 
and then there's the generic risk of surgery itself like blood clots in the legs and the lungs which is a risk in a lot of different types of operations but again we take precautions for that um, with special stockings we make you wear um, inflatable boots that you wear during the procedure and whilst in your bed and also we do I always give patients the very next day um, some Clexane which is a small little injection in the tummy that keeps the blood a bit thin uh, for the first couple of days and that's pretty much it. At the Spine MDT our goal is to find the least invasive solution that offers you the longest lasting result. We're able to do that with a multidisciplinary approach as we're partnered with osteopaths, chiropractors and physiotherapists in the region as well as uh, pain specialists. I hope you found the video helpful. Please click on the link below in the description to read the full blog on this article. Uh, click the subscribe button for future videos. I'm going to be making more videos about different procedures, explaining them, as well as other problems with uh, the spine. Um, please feel free to visit us and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have.